Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Jeff Fetcher. I'm the superintendent here at Abington School District. And I want to first thank you all for joining us this evening. As you are likely aware, the district has been engaged in a long-term facilities planning process for nearly three years. This initiative was set in motion with a clear goal to identify and address the needs of our aging school buildings. At the September 24th board meeting, we shared proposed options to address what the district has identified as the highest priority from this facilities planning process, and that is Abington Middle School, this building that we are in this evening. Some of the needs in this building are environmental, such as needing more efficient HVAC systems for better air quality and climate control, as well as safety enhancements, such as more modern fire protection and security systems. This facility, as it was built in the mid 1960s, is not up to ADA code. The Abington School District Administration, as well as the Board of School Directors, have made a strong commitment to our mission and vision to equitable access. It is our commitment to provide an equitable education experience for all students and ADA compliance is essential to that mission. Improving students' learning environments will provide them with a better educational experience all around. Students learn better in environments where they feel safe and welcome and their physical needs are met. An updated middle school will benefit our teachers and staff with a better layout to monitor student activity, which improves safety and more classroom flexibility for differentiated teaching strategies. Some of the educational needs in this building include not having a room big enough to even host one whole grade at one, at one time, which impacts school culture and community and limits opportunities during and after the school day. We also lack enough small group instruction rooms and learning support or gifted enhancement. And while we do a good job of implementing our teaming model in the space that we have, classroom arrangements are not ideal to implement that model. Teaming models exist so that we could provide smaller learning communities within the larger school, which helps support students' sense of belonging. This mid-century building was originally designed as a high school for grades nine and 10 not necessarily meant to meet the needs of students who are young as 11 years old. Our goal is to intentionally design our future space tailored to our students and teachers needs rather than having to adapt our program to fit within the walls of a 60 year old building. For example, the 1960s era former shop spaces are now being used as instructional classrooms for our our STEM and robotics labs. We retrofit where we are able, but we would benefit from having more modern facilities to offer these project-based learning opportunities. I thank those of you who have already provided input to date about what you see as the needs of this building. Input from teachers, staff, parents and guardians, students and residents of Abington and Rockledge has been essential in shaping these options uh, that we reviewed at the board meeting and that we will further review this evening. Your feedback will continue to guide our efforts as we further evaluate these proposed options. Tonight's event is split into two parts. We will begin with a presentation on the facilities planning process and, and an overview of the proposed options for the future of the middle school. There will be some time following the presentation for questions. For those within the room tonight, please scan the QR code on the agenda you received to submit your questions. For those watching from home, you'll find the link to submit a question on the event description for this live stream on our YouTube channel. We will respond to questions in the time we have available before the start of the, our open house. If we do not get to your questions tonight, we will respond to you via email. 
Recurring questions may be added to the frequently asked questions portion of our microsite, consolidated by theme. The second part of our event is an open house, which will begin at 7.15 and run through 8.30. The open house features information stations where you can ask questions, receive information, and share your input. There is a map on the back of your agenda with locations of the information stations. At this time, I will now turn over to Phil Solomon, Regional Manager at ICS, for the presentation portion of our town hall. Well, thank you for coming tonight. I hope you find this evening informative and helps you get some information that you may need to give us further input, because that's that's what this is about. It's about gathering input and kind of refining options. So we've got kind of three key things to go over tonight. It's really the process that we're using, um, the options that we're considering at this point, and then next steps. So here's the exploded agenda, but essentially those, those key items are what we're gonna cover with a couple extra little bits of information in between. So to date, uh, we've actually gathered quite a bit of input. So I, I've put up here kind of the, the different spots where we've gathered input from teachers and students and community members, et cetera. All said and done, there's about 750 people who, who gave input to start this process. And those people generated about 800 different comments, and those comments were rated by all the people, which was about 15,000 ratings. Uh, for anybody who's interested in the full information and all of the survey data and everything else, that was all presented uh, on, uh, at the March 12th board meeting. And all of that information can also be found online at 1asd1future.org. That's the microsite that Dr. Fetcher spoke of. So anything that's been generated, you can find there, including this and all the other presentations. So the, tip, the process that we're using is we're, we're kind of doing this big community engagement to help shape the options. Uh, the options will be uh, put together and we'll gather additional information on that and try to narrow them through the process. Right now, it's a very broad uh, four different options that we're looking at. We'd hope to gather that down to two at some point. We're gonna take all this information and give it to the decision makers uh, who will then decide what is the, the best long-term strategy for the district. So just a little window into how we used uh, data to, to shape the options that we're looking at tonight. So we started with a, a feasibility or condition assessment over two years ago, where we, we looked at this building and we looked at all the systems, age, condition, et cetera. We then went to the internal stakeholders of the building and asked them, you know, how, how is this building either meeting or not meeting your needs? And they provided a significant amount of input. Uh, input. Uh, what we found, the number one thing that they listed, and I'll just read it, is that the middle schools should either be completely reconstructed or split into two middle schools that are smaller. So that was that was kind of the, the largest input that we got from the educators. The second also dealt with the size of the building as well. Uh, that one was more on the, the common spaces. And that reads, the spaces in the middle school, such as hallways, assembly areas, are insufficient relative to current instructional need. So we used that information to kind of shape what we were going to look at moving forward. Uh, you can see from there moving, moving out, you also had HVAC, school security, uh, restrooms, learning environment, et cetera. But these were all the key issues that the educators came up with. So we took the original three options and we exploded it into about 12. And each one of those 12 had sub options to them. We're not gonna go through all of those tonight. Uh, what we did in the interim was we took the following criteria and started to narrow these into the four that you'll see. And these are things such as educational impact, stakeholder input, community impact, enrollment, facility assessment needs. Uh, the next one is about zoning restrictions and site limitations. That really limits what you can build on certain parcels in the district. Uh, so that, that was a limiting factor. Then we also had operational impact costs, long-term financial costs, and budget and tax impact. So all of these are considerations when you're looking at uh, what the right solution is. So here are, the, here are the options that we're considering for further evaluation. So it's really option one, which is refresh the existing footprint here. 
and that's got a sub option, which is to demo a portion of it and build build uh, an addition as well. So that's that's kind of option one is, is work with what we have here. Option two is build a new 2200 student middle school on this campus and then demolish this building. So kind of a, a cleaner option. Option three is really getting towards that the building is a little too big. So that option basically splits the middle school population into two and then builds two middle schools. That would be 1,100 students apiece. So that's kind of a two building solution. Then option four was a different way to get at a smaller learning community. The, the district was interested in, okay, well, what if we did a reconfiguration? So there was a reconfiguration into a five, six building and a seven, eight building. And those are sized for 1500 students because that's, that's four grade levels, not three. So that's why there's differences in population between option three and option four. So when you boil it down, there's kind of a, a single middle school strategy or a two middle school strategy. When you look at how you can implement those, there'd be no impact on the elementary school level for the first two options. And we'll get into this in more detail as we look, work, uh, walk through this. And then in the second two options, there could be some elementary school impact. So we're gonna talk about that uh, when we get to that portion. So just the minimum, minimum um, investments needed for this building. When we went through and did condition assessments, there's a significant amount of work. There's, there's really very little that's salvageable in the existing footprint. Uh, everything is well beyond its useful life, including sprinklers. There's many ADA uh, needs for the building that just don't meet current code, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, roofing, window systems, finishes, cabinetry, casework. You're essentially talking about the whole building at this point. Not to mention the layout is, is not a current uh, educational layout with the interior um, classrooms and the exterior hallways. It's just, it's very different than what a modern middle school would look like. So even if you were gonna do a like for like replacement of all the systems in the building, it's roughly $206 million worth of work that needs to be done. You can see this is the original booklet from the building when it was opened in, I believe, 64. So now we're gonna walk into the options. So uh, as I said before, there's an option one, which is a single middle school option. And this is essentially working within the footprint. So we're calling this 1A. And this option is the 206 million. It's kind of replace in kind with some reconfiguration. So some of the things to consider, uh, you can see the footprint is the same. The size of the building is 301,000 square feet. So that's the existing size. So some of the things to consider is it does address all the infrastructure needs. So all of those systems would be completely refreshed. Uh, there is limited disturbance to any of the athletic fields. Uh, you'll see in some of the other options that we would actually have to move them. Uh, we say limited educational improvement because you're working within the confines of the existing building. You can't change the sight lines that much. You can't reconfigure the building except in the footprint. So it's gonna be hard to get that teaming model working effectively in this footprint. Uh, it does not address additional space needs for programs in the future, which you'll see uh, we ran a program, an educational program, and the space needed for that program, it works out to about 345,000 square feet. We're working in about 300,000 square feet. So it's, so it's a little shy of the program that, that wants to be run here. Uh, to do a, a, a renovation here, it would be what's called an occupied renovation. So there's no other space to put the students. So it would take an enormous amount of modulars uh, modular classrooms, these are uh, rental classrooms that, that you put students in while you're constructing uh, maybe a floor at a time. Um, so we would definitely have to utilize those to, to renovate this space. The timeline, we have design and permitting up to 20 months. Uh, permitting is, a, is an involved process and sometimes that can uh, take a little longer than anticipated. Bidding is about three months and then construction would be up to 48 months. So there's a lot of time that's going to be needed to work through this building while occupied. Post-construction, about three months. You have 1B, which you're still mostly using the footprint of this existing building, except you're gonna demo a portion and then do additions to this. this. This configuration that we have here, you can see that there's additions in this kind of orange color. And this is more the $268 million Level. These are all estimates. These are very conceptual at this point. Uh, again, if you look at the considerations, very similar to the other uh, considerations, except 
that it will address the future needs <clears throat> of programs. So you, you get to build a little bit more space. Total space will be 345,000 square feet when this project would be done. Uh, timeline is essentially the same. You're still doing an occupied renovation. So you're still use, utilizing the, um, the classrooms, uh, modular classrooms. Option two is a build a new uh, middle school and then demo the old. There is uh, a range of 252 million to 307 million uh, for this option. You can see this is not the footprint. This is a representation of the size of the building, uh, just to give an idea. So some of the considerations for this, um, it, it will allow a, a clean sheet of paper. So you're going to you're going to purpose build this around the current educational models today in a flexible environment. You'll be able to, to add new safety uh, features and new sight lines. Just there's a lot that you can do that you have to consider in a modern building that that just wasn't considered in you know 1960. Uh, for this, you don't have to relocate the students. So you would build the new middle school first, and then obviously they would move over, and then uh, you would demo the existing, and then you'd have to rebuild all the fields because this actually sits where some fields are right now. So you want to rebuild all the athletic fields. Uh, the timeline for this, uh, same for design and permitting, could be up to 20 months, could be shorter, but we're, we're leaving, uh, have a little bit of a conservative timeline there. Construction is a little less, 42 months, and then construction and closeout of three. Now, some of that, the building would be ready earlier, but all the track and everything else still needs to be relocated after the building is ready. Option 3A is a two middle school option. So this is really getting into what uh, the teacher feedback had said. The option two is you can certainly build that as a you know school within a school so you can make that feel like a much smaller learning environment whereas this will be a smaller learning environment. So option three is essentially build a new middle school on campus here, and then build an additional middle school on Glenside Weldon. Now, some of the, some of the considerations, again, that will create two 1,100 student middle schools, so smaller. Um, there's less transition from the elementary school to uh, a large middle school as it is now. There will be some duplication of some services. So you get economies of scale when you have a building this big. So there will be operational cost impact in addition to building costs. The district is working through a model of that right now so that we can uh, get an accurate representation of that. That will require redistricting the middle school populations because you're gonna have to split them in two. So you're gonna have to come up with two catchments. Whenever you redistrict, it's, it's always very challenging. Uh, so just something to consider. Again, we will have to relocate the tracks and fields that are um, being, uh, where the building would be built over them. And then there is some consideration of what can you build on that Glenside Weldon site? Our initial pass, certainly you can build these buildings, but sometimes that gets a little more complicated. You need municipal approval for a lot of different things, uh, any building of this size. So that's something to consider as well. The timeline for this is the same uh, timeline for design and permitting about 20 months, bidding about three months. This has about 48 months of construction time and then posting construction time about three months. 3B, let's assume that um, if that middle school cannot be built on Glenside Weldon, it's too big. Uh, the other way you could go about doing that, doing that would be to renovate and add to Copper Beach. So you would use that building as one of the middle schools and you would build a new middle school in that same location. <coughs> Excuse me. And then you would essentially move Copper Beach to Glenside Weldon. Now, Glenside Weldon did have an elementary school at one time, so this should, um, should have a little bit easier of municipal approval. Uh, same considerations with, um, with 3A. The only difference here is you're really you're really getting into three buildings. So you're, you're almost building three entire buildings and the, the cost for that is substantial. It's 497 million because you're, you're essentially rebuilding three different buildings. Timeline for this extends out because there's, uh, you know, obviously there's three buildings and you've got to stage them correctly. So the timeline is up to 24 months for permitting. You still have the three months for bidding and then up to 60 months to complete the whole process. Uh, in construction, and then you have your closeout time. 
The last option is option four. So this is where you really look into uh, a different way to address this, which is a grade realignment. So you would build a five, six center and a seven, eight center. <clears throat> this strategy ranges uh, from 365 million to over 500 million, 505 million. What you're doing here is you're essentially uh, creating, again, two smaller learning uh, environments with the 5-6 center and then 7-8 center. And then you're, you're actually reconfiguring the district because now you don't have K5, 6, 8, 9, 12. You'd have K4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 12. So it actually creates one more transition that students would have to go through in their entire career. It does uh, create that smaller learning environment that we were talking about before. Uh, there, again, would be duplication of some services because of the economies of scale you get in the bigger buildings. <clears throat> again, relocating the track, and you're essentially moving the neighborhood school from Glens Glenside Weldon to the Glenside Weldon site. Uh, this has got a very similar timeline to uh, the other, where you have construction up to 60 months with 24 months of permitting. So just a summary of the options, and, and we can certainly dig into more detail when we get into the open house portion, but we, ha we have a single building middle school strategy, so you can kind of think of it that way, and that's either a renovation or a new build. Then you have the two building middle school strategy. You then have ranges because you have sub options in there. So option one is in that 206 million to 268 range, depending on what you build um, in terms of additions and renovations. Option two is the 252 to 307, 320 to 497, 365 to 505. You can see that they overlap a little bit, um, which makes sense. You know, sometimes building something from the inside out is more costly than building something new from the ground up. Um, what we're really looking to get out of this next level of input is, is really where does the community think, what is the right configuration for this? Is it this existing building? Is it a new building? Is it two new buildings? That's the input that we're trying to, to understand and then narrow down so that there's not so many options to chase. We're still continuing to, to work through these. Um, they are a moving target and, and we're gonna shape them based off of feedback that we get. The next steps. So, you know, we're gonna continue communications. Um, you know, there's a, there's a big communications plan to keep everyone up to date with anything that's moving. Uh, we'll keep refining these options. There is additional financial modeling that's going on. As I said before, uh, there's gonna be some operational costs uh, that are not incurred right now if you chose to split the building into two. There's also a tax impact that is getting worked through because uh, there's a handful of different moving factors there, including time of the bond and all these other items. So we're, we're working towards a, a financial model for that. And we will have additional stakeholder input throughout this process we're looking at having another scientific survey in the November, December timeframe. And then early in 25, we're looking at the uh, board perhaps making a decision on the, this future building. So back to the big chart, and we're, oops, we're still kind of in the solutions piece, and we'll still be gathering additional feedback before it gets into the decision process. The approximate timelines are end of October, beginning of November, and then starting the decision process kind of in that November, December, January timeframe. And then at some point that at that time, a decision will be made for the, the long range plan. With that, we'll move into questions. And just uh, just putting this on the backdrop that any, any information you need is in oneasd1future.org. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Solomon. Um, it's important to remember that the district is still evaluating these options and uh, events like tonight and moving forward, um, your input is essential in shaping uh, what the future options will, will hold. Uh, a reminder that uh, this evening there will be an opportunity after um, some of the questions that were submitted uh, for us to share your input at the different stations that we have but also if you're at home and not present, um, please make sure that you do go to the website and there's also opportunities for input and questions there as well. Um, 
we also encourage that um, you use the con um, connect form on the 1ASD, One Future website. So this website has a form where you can ask questions or share your input um, in the weeks and months ahead. So if you don't have an opportunity to ask a question tonight, we will be responsive and we will also um, take input in that site as well, which is greatly appreciated. So we'll now answer some of the questions that we received before moving into our open house at, a, at a approximately 7.15. I'm gonna ask our panelists if you could please introduce yourself um, and then we will begin. Bill Solomon from ICS. Uh, Tim Guider from ICS. Bob Curtin from Abington School District. Jim Melkor, Assistant Superintendent. Tony Butts, Director of Teaching and Learning. Shamika Brown, School Board President. Melissa Mowry, School Board Vice President. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, one of the, well, actually a couple of questions came in related to funding. Um, how will this project be funded and what are the cost implications for residents? Mr. Solomon? So the, the simple answer is it would be funded by a referendum. So there's, there's really no options that the district is going to be able to just pay for out of the budget. So a referendum process would be when uh, this gets turned into an option gets selected it gets turned into a ballot question and then the community votes on whether they choose to um, choose to agree with that ballot question or not thank you um, was there a second portion to that i'm sorry um it was how would it be funded and what are the cost implications for residents yeah the cost implications are being put together right now it's not fully fleshed out what we're trying to work towards is an actual kind of a, a tax calculator that would work for every parcel because the parcels are a varying uh, costs and uh, a single number is not going to be representative of what each person would need to pay. So we're working towards that. That's something we will have uh, prior to giving additional input. Um, the next question is in regard to um, current students and students who will be in the middle school building over the next few years. What are the plans to address the concerns that we have currently? Dr. Melkor, do you want to speak to that question? I think I'll defer to Mr. Curtin, if that's okay. okay. Currently, all of the systems are operating properly, and as systems go down, we make any repair that's needed. Everything right now is from the HVA system to the operating heating systems is operational. I want to speak to that from a, a student perspective in our educational program. Um, we're constantly evaluating what we can do with our educational program uh, to meet modern needs. Uh, of our students. So uh, we are, you know, examining things like um, sometimes hallway traffic and are there ways to uh, alter that or, you know, class schedules and things of that nature to improve the experience for our students. Um, and I know we talked a little bit about timelines, but if we could just um, Go over that again. What the time? What are the timelines for when the project will be completed? And do we have an estimate of uh, what school class might be the first ones to occupy the new facility? So the um, the timelines were all kind of listed the durations in the the presentation. So each option has an individual uh, timeline associated with them. Um, but you have to pick a date that would that you would assume starting design, which wouldn't be until sometime next year, uh, towards the end of next year. So 2025 and then you have up to 20 months of design for that uh, permitting and then you start construction construction is anywhere from 42 months to 60 months so um, in some of those options like like Phil mentioned you're touching uh, three buildings or potentially renovating three buildings um, the earliest that one of the buildings would be done would be potentially uh, the summer of 2029 and then Moving on, other buildings would come online, you know, 2020 or 2030 and 32 in the in those options three and four, which are the, the extended timelines. Um, the the earliest uh, timeline would be uh, option two, which is the demo, like building the new middle school 
demoing and then, and then continuing on with the uh, parking lots and the athletic fields. And that would finish in the summer of uh, 2029 is what we're anticipating, assuming starting design next year. Um, the next question is about um, options 3B and options 4. Um, has there been any uh, research into the um, benefits of splitting a building into grades 5 and 6 and 7 and 8 versus a 6 to 8 building? Um, for example, social, behavioral, educational benefits or any drawbacks? <laughs> Um, with the different grade configurations, as you can tell from anyone who's worked with fifth and sixth graders and seventh and eighth graders, uh, one of the advantages of splitting up into those two grade bands as an option um, is kind of having them within their peers that are s similar in age and, and growth and development with an emphasis on um, emotional and mental and academic development. So that is one advantage. It's, it's sometimes, as you know, if you are a parent out there, knowing the difference between uh, the physical um, uh, as well as the emotional of a fifth grader versus an eighth grader and the needs of those children, um, having those types of grade bands between the, uh, and with fifth and sixth and then seventh and eighth just makes a lot of sense, especially when you consider those emotional and social needs. They're very different. It, I know it's only four years apart, um, but they're very different in what they need um, growing up and also what they need as far as academic and, and determining their level of independence and um, sense of identity and what they need in order to develop that sense of identity. Uh, so that's one argument or one set of viewpoints when it comes to understanding or the use of those, um, putting students in that kind of narrowed grade band. Um, some of the advantages that you would see with uh, a grade six to eight or um, that type of configuration where you're having two of the middle schools having the, uh, the same set of grade bands um, would be the deployment of services. Um, to two buildings that have the same grade levels, um, you would be able to scale and you would be able to deploy those services a little bit more readily than when you have split grade bands. Um, but I would say that, you know, as we move forward, we would really explore those different options to see what really makes sense to the growth and the maturation and the needs of the students as they mature. Um, that social element and that um, who their peers and who they're interacting with, whether it's in a small learning community or in a team, um, really does make a difference, especially in that adoles those adolescent years and those teenage years. I think those of you that are parents in the audience and teachers in the audience, you know how critical um, those years are. So we will definitely explore those in greater detail, but that gives you just an overall understanding of why some people may have suggested um, putting those that configuration together. There are some school districts um, that do that type of configuration, and obviously there are other school districts um, that would do smaller um, buildings of the six through eight configuration. Can I just ask a related follow-up question to that? Um, could you mention or talk briefly about the typical size of middle schools in surrounding districts. I think that might be helpful for members of the community and parents in particular to understand. Absolutely, so I'm just gonna reference Montgomery County as a point of reference so that we have some context. Um, Abington Middle School is the largest middle school in Montgomery County. Um, currently our enrollment is over 2,000, so we're at 2,200, 2,050, I'm sorry. Um, I may have been looking at, at uh, two years data when we started this project. So 2050, so but we're the only school that's over 2,000 or close to 2,000. Um, I think the next comparable schools or size of school districts um, would be around 800 students less, so around the 1,200 mark. So 800 students and 800 adolescent and teenage bodies is a lot of bodies to work with. 
in one given physical space. Um, as you can well imagine, we're not talking about just a dozen, we're talking about approximately 800 students greater than any other schools. And, and I believe the two that were the closest were Colonial School District and North Penn School District's Pendale School Middle School in that school district. We do also see schools that are around 600 to 800 mark, considerably um, a, a, a number of them that are less than 1,000. So we do see where being less than 1,000 seems to be something that is um, what other districts experience, um, but definitely we are, we are by far the largest, um, exceeding the next largest by 800 students. And we are, in terms of student population, the second or third largest district in the county? I believe we are the second largest, second to North Penn. Thank I you. I believe that's accurate, right? So this question is also in relation to the two middle school options. What are the duplicate services? Um, how many more people will have to be hired? And what are the estimated costs for those services? I think some of the services, uh, you know, there would be a duplication of some components within the building, such as food service, with money in two cafeterias, nursing services, um, Custodial services certainly uh, would be increased. So we're working through, as Mr. Solomon mentioned, we're working through the cost analysis of what that duplication would mean to the ongoing costs beyond construction. Um, can you explain what a referendum means, uh, such as voting to increase our taxes? And has there been any study on what residents can afford? I can I can speak to the referendum process. That's um, that's certainly a process that's been set up in Pennsylvania. It's essentially a ballot question. Um, you know, if anyone's lived in Philadelphia, uh, ballot questions are quite you know, familiar. Um, they're a little less familiar in the schools, but uh, certainly the same process in terms of what uh, people can afford. That is that's not a question that's in my expertise. Can two middle schools be built on the middle school site by relocating the administration building staff um, and using that expanded site? I like the idea of two middle schools, but not impacting other sites or splitting the population. Uh, we've looked at so many different options. I have to see if we had uh, had one where we tore down the existing admin building. Uh, that really doesn't give you enough space. If you actually looked at the, the space between them, you could not fit two full-size middle schools in that location. Uh, we have looked at maybe using the admin building, but the admin building is also quite aged as well. Uh, it's not ready for school. It wasn't even built as a uh, modern school as well. So using that building is really we ruled that out as part of the solution. Do we, I, just off, I'm curious, I, just off the top of our head, do we know what the square footage of the admin building is? It's about 30, 30,000 square feet or more. Okay. Okay. Tim can look that up and get back to you. Okay. I think it's around 30,000. Uh, so it might be closer to 60,000 60, square feet. Okay. It's significantly less space than is needed yeah. for a middle school. Okay. It's not even sized as one of your larger elementary schools. Right. Thank you. Who will ultimately be making the decisions on this project? Well, certainly, I mean, I, I can answer. It's certainly going to be the school board uh, first. So the school board would come up with whatever option they think is the best long-term strategy for the district. This is a 40, 50 year decision. And then from there, that gets moved into a ballot question. So ultimately the taxpayers make a decision on this. Um, the next question, um, one of the biggest challenges today is security. Which of the options do we feel is the least secure? I might rephrase that a little bit, but I would say that uh, you can get the most 
increase in security when you have a blank sheet of paper to work with. So anything when you're building new, you're going to build with modern sight lines around modern um, video capabilities and all the other uh, emergency services that are necessary in a modern building. It's unfortunate that we have to talk, talk about that, but that was not a consideration in 1960. Um, the next question is, are there any members of the panel who pay Abington and Rockledge property taxes? Yes. <laughs> Two of us. Um, we received an additional question about explaining, again, what referendum means um, about being a vote to increase taxes. That is correct. It will be a ballot question that would have the total amount. Um, and yes, it would be a vote to increase taxes to pay for the middle school or whatever the middle school solution is. Would, can I just ask a follow-up, maybe clarifying question to that? And I'm curious myself about this. So. Um, for other projects, we have um, floated a bond, right? And that's how we have financed those projects. How does a referendum differ? Because we because we need the money up front, right? So we're not. It's not like we're the referendum creates a special savings account, and then taxpayers pay their increased taxes into it, right? Yeah, there's a specific wording to it, and it is to borrow the amount of money, whatever the option would be, to construct whatever you know the board chooses, um, and then essentially that is the that is the ballot question. It's a simple yes/no question. Uh, what we're trying to work towards is a tax calculator, so that that literally would be everyone can take their um, value of their house, their estimated value, and it's not that's not um, that's actually going to be on your tax bill and put that into a calculator and know exactly what that means to each, each person who would be voting for that. So you could, you could absolutely look at every parcel in the district and uh, figure that out. Do we have any more? Uh, we're past our time, um, yeah. but there was one more question that came in about the tax process and um, sorry, I'm just reading this one quick. What do tax, do this, does the tax rate go down once loans are paid off? Yes, that's correct. That's how a ballot question works in Pennsylvania. Once, that's how a ballot question works in Pennsylvania is once the, once the um, bond is paid off, that millage is given back. So whatever that was uh, on the tax before is now reduced. So by law. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone for your questions and uh, feedback. Uh, at this portion of the evening, we are going to move to an open house. This is an opportunity to ask one-on-one -on -one questions, but I'd like to remind you that um, we still are able to take input and feedback as well as questions uh, through the various methods that I spoke about earlier. So thank you very much for, for coming out and please proceed to the open house portion. <laughs>